All right, today we are doing something more in line with the older videos that I've done before. Um, it's not another uh, intro to QM video, mainly because I was preparing one, but I forgot how hard quantum mechanics was. And so I need more time to sort of review my basics before I can start doing that. So in the meantime, we'll do something a lot easier, and that is quantum machine learning. Um, so today what we're going to be talking about is um, something I, I usually don't talk about, which is a quasi-theoretical result. I uh, try to make it my business to avoid theorists, uh, but this paper looked uh, easy to implement, so that's in all honesty why I picked it. Um, so yeah, the specific paper we're going to sort of be looking at is called Generalization in Quantum Machine Learning from Few Training Data. Um, it was published in Nature Communications on August 22nd, 2022. So much more recent than I thought. I thought this paper was so old, but it's, you know, August. That's last month. Crazy. Um, so anyway, basically, I'm not going to go through the math of this paper because I didn't read the math of this paper and neither did the reviewers. So, you know, why bother? Um, I'm just going to present the key results here, and that is basically that um, they show that the generalization bound for a quantum machine learning model um, is one dependent on the structure, but you know we, we won't bother ourselves with that, it is scales approximately in a manner that we're going to discuss. I don't want to write the key formula down first. What, what I want to talk about first is, let me make sure this is visible, yep, is the concept of generalization. So basically generalization is a big, big idea in machine learning, but you can basically say generalization is the difference between your performance. So I'll write your performance on your train. Oh, wow, that's bad. Um, versus your performance on the true like distribution. So right, when we have samples of data, it's from some true distribution P of X. This could be a, a vector um, that we're trying to model. And this is true, images are from this, and that's generative modeling. You'll often see tries to sample from P of X. Um, and so we're, we're approximating our ability to uh, basically uh, look at the true distribution using examples of it. Uh, because closed form, the solution to true distributions for anything that we really care about is, is inconceivable, right? What's the true distribution of, you know, image pixels? Like, I, there, there's no closed form for that. Well, maybe there is, but it's, it's not easy. And so that's why we use validation data, right? We say, okay, we have some set of data here, X, Y, right? This is our training data. But then we have some validation, XB, comma, YB, that we hold out and we don't use in training and, and we use this to approximate the test error. That's the whole point of validation, right? So if this is going down and the validation is staying the same, you say that you're overfitting because this is our proxy for the testing data or for the true, you know, uh, data. So generalization can sort of concisely be represented if we say the generalization of our um, model M uh, or our parameters, maybe I can do theta is equal to, um, oh, that's the wrong tab. Basically our expected loss. Uh, I'll just say this is a loss function of theta. I mean, there's obviously like the, you can do X, right? And whatever the, the training data is, the X and Y's, but um, whatever our expected loss is in the true um, you know, where x comma y are from this true distribution um, minus, and this lot can be obviously um, you, know, you can say this is the absolute value here because this should always be smaller, right? Our loss should, or sorry, this should always be larger um, because our expected loss uh, should be bigger in the training or in the testing is in the training because um, we're approximating this, right? If our 
if our true loss was lower than our training loss, well then we're in a good spot. We'll just say that way. And this is right our approximation over the training data of our you know loss function. We'll say data comma x comma y. So basically, this is saying this is true distribution. This is our approximation. So when these two are equal, we're saying, okay, we're doing pretty good. When this is way bigger than this, we're not doing so good. And this is hard. We cannot, the, I'll just note this right here, closed form, finding this is uh, not good. Um, we're not going to be able to analytically compute the loss, expected loss on the true distribution, because we don't know what the true distribution is. And, and that's the key point there. So we'll approximate this um, numerically. And the way that we'll approximate this is by saying, okay, we have we have a big data set. Let's say now this is not good, right? For training purposes, if you want if you want to train your you know your large language model or whatever, you don't want to hold out most of the data for testing. This is just sort of to, to provide you know insight into the theor theoretical background here. Um, but say we have some big data set, well, ten thousand data points. We'll give training just you know a hundred. And then we could evaluate on the other 9,900. And that's a pretty good uh, estimate, right, of our um, the true sort of distribution because it's so much larger. Um, now, it's not perfect, but it, it basically, if you look at um, sampling and you basically look at, I believe it's called like the Huffington-Bound, I forget how to spell it. You can see basically there are ways to sort of approximate the how good how many samples you need to get a certain error rate from the distribution etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is a, a pretty good numerical approximate so now let's get into the qml stuff now if you've done classical machine learning you'll know about all the hypothesis space and how you know you have your vc bound and breaking hypothesis and you know it's well it's been a while since i've done that but you'll know that neural networks are kind of terrible um, from this perspective right because if you look at the VC bound of just a simple NLP, it'll scale um, very poorly. Um, but you know they work in practice, so who cares? Uh, that's often my pers why I sort of don't do much in the theory side of things is because we don't we're not doing QML or ML um, to understand the world better in the sense that right if we have our standard model. Of physics, which is obviously a model, it's not perfect. Improvements on that and understanding the theory of that tells us information about the world as it is. Improvements on ML theory doesn't tell us information about the world as it is. If the theoretical improvements result in empirical improvements, that's interesting, but just knowing more theory about ML is, is not interesting to me or, or probably most people because we, ML isn't the world, it's, it's useful, it's a tool. And we want it to be a better tool. And if theory helps that, then that's good. You know, that's why I you, you don't see people talking about error bounds for machine learning model. Who, who cares what the error is? Does it work or does it not work? Does the large language model seem like a chatbot or does it not? These these are the sorts of things why I often um, sort of critical of some of these these areas. And it's not just me. There's a quote I was looking for it before this, but I couldn't find it. Um, from a famous computer scientist in the 50s or, or maybe later, maybe in the 90s. I, I don't remember the dates, but basically they said, no one has done more damage to the field of computer science than complexity theorists. Uh, so it's paraphrasing that. I'll, I'll see if I can find it and, and, and maybe that'll be interesting. Yeah, I just looked again. I couldn't find it. I saw it. I saw it attributed to someone on Twitter. So who knows if it's actually true, but I, I thought it was funny and representative of my thoughts as well to a certain degree not that theory is useless or complexity theory is useless it's just anyway now that i've ragged on theorists enough um i mean let's be real they're not watching these videos um we can actually talk about the key results here and that is that this generalization bound for our model g of theta can be bounded. So this is order notation. So this is asymptotically true that this scales the square root of t log t over n. Now, what does this mean? This means that t is 
trainable gates um, and n is number of training data. I'll just do that's this you know the magnitude of our training data. So what does this mean? And this means intuitively the more gates you have, the more training data you would need to get the exact same performance uh, uh, asymptotically. Now there are obviously examples where you can look at really weird edge cases, but this is basically the key result. And there's variations of this for specific architectures of theta, but this is sort of the key result that we're gonna be looking at. So what does this mean? This means that for, you know, say, let me scroll down, say T is a constant, right? We're not changing the number of parameters in our model. That means that our generalization loss is scaling O of one over root N. Uh, so that means we get a lot of benefit, right? If you know what the square one over the square root curve, it looks something like this. Um, so that means from here to, you know, here, whatever, you know, the scale is, this could be one to a hundred or 10 to a million, you know, I, I don't know, this is an unlabeled axis, but this is where you get a lot of return on investment. Um, and so that's why for a few training data, right? If we go 10, let's just say that's 10 and this is a hundred and this is a million, right? You get a huge improvement here, but less of an improvement here. Um, relatively. And so that's sort of like the potential is that in this range, where there's not a ton of training data, right? You know, large language models are, you know, out here, but uh, that's just sort of the scaling that we're going to be looking at. So that's the big idea is you can check out the paper, of course, I'll link it in the description. Um, and you can see, you know, more information in that if, if you so desire. Uh, but for now, we're just going to jump into the code. That's sort of the key result. QML model scale, you know, T. You can sort of drop the log T, right? Because um, approximately square root of T over N. That's that's the key result here. Uh, so that's useful for designing circuits. You know, we're going to have huge circuits. We're going to need more data. But anyway, we'll just jump into the actual code now. All right, jumping right into it, we are now in the code. I'm doing this in a Jupyter Notebook. I'm thinking about moving more and more over to Jupyter Notebooks. If people are opposed to that, I can stop. It's just useful for sort of rapid prototyping of code. It's not as useful for running large scale experiments, but I don't run large scale experiments. So here we are. Got our suite of standard imports here, TensorFlow, TFQ, all the normal good stuff. Senpai, painfully, I, I, it's always my pet peeve is circ and senpai. But anyway, um, I have here a copy code, code I 100% did not write. Uh, this is code from the QCNN tutorial on TFQ. In the paper, excuse me, in the paper they have the code um, or the example they give, they give two examples. The second one is not as interesting as the first one. The first one is the um, classification, phase classification of some top, topological phases for some cluster Hamiltonian. Um, and so we're not doing that because uh, I don't know how to generate the cluster Hamiltonian ground states efficiently. Um, and I don't want to read all about that. So what we're doing instead is MNIST because it's a classic. And so, but the model they use was a QCNN. Um, so I figured I'd keep that the same, uh, which keep in mind has weight sharing and which may be useful um, because there are other bounds that apply to the weight sharing kind of model in the paper. But all of this is just copied because, you know, why don't want to reinvent the wheel, you know? This is the new part, and this was, I think, kind of handy. Uh, hopefully it's correct. Uh, and this is in the example, the QCN example, it's hard-coded for a specific size. This is designed for any 2n number of qubits. Um, is really nice uh, and I'll probably be using this again because you know I might check it more rigorously as correct but this is a good sort of general function basically we just iterate right every single time you pull half the qubits down so you have log base two layers that you need um, you just create the number of parameters and you basically just say okay we're doing the pooling 
and we're doing the convolutions. Um, this is the comm circuit, right? The convolutions and the points. And the point, of course, has, uh, you're, you're having it every time how big it is. Um, and at the very end, you only care about the last two qubits. You're pulling together into the very last qubit, which is, um, which we'll see later. Uh, this I copied from the MNIST uh, code because, once again, why reinvent the wheel? Basically, all this is doing is downloading the MNIST data sets and uh, data sets, sorry, and just scaling it and only keeping track of the threes and sixes and all that sort of stuff. Here we have a convert to circuit, which is slightly different. They did a binary encoding in the TFQ documentation. Here I'm just putting it to the power of the value rather than you know, a harsh cutoff, which is just fine. Uh, here we're resizing it to be different uh, numbers of qubits. So this is a four by four image, 16 qubits, three by three is nine, two by two is four qubits, just converting them to circuits and then creating the models. So we just have our um, create model circuit, which is this up here, this QCNN we're making. And then on the very last qubit, we, uh, we measure that. Uh, we can see we have four, nine, and 16 qubits here. We're not gonna actually work with 16. I thought I could train it, but no, that is way too long to train on my laptop. Uh, so here, this is our optimization loop. I use both hinge and mean squared error um, just to try stuff out. This is the you know standard atom optimizer. Uh, we're just, right, we're just doing a very traditional optimization. We get our predictions from the model and our training data. We um, get the loss function, apply, get the gradients, apply the gradients. We get our test loss here. Um, so every iteration, we keep track of the training and testing loss, which are gonna be used as a proxy for the true generalization. Um, then we're saying, okay, uh, we train on 100 examples here and test on 200 to evaluate the difference. This could be bigger. I just it empirically didn't change the results a lot. I ran originally like 2,000 or something, 1,000, and it looked the same. It just took longer, so I figured, you know, why wait? Um, and then we can see here the 4 and 9 qubit examples for the hinge loss function. You can see that uh, these are very different. It's not a really a truly fair comparison here uh, because, you know, there's, um, this isn't, this is more trainable gates. It's also a bigger problem. And so you don't want to focus too much, I guess, on the, this isn't the best way of sort of describing this because the upper part, right? If we're trying to show the scaling of the upper part is based on gates, not on qubits. So I wouldn't look too much into this because a nine qubit problem is fundamentally different than what it's doing. Additionally, um, this is basically a graphic from figure 2B of the paper, plotting the training versus testing accuracy. So if this uh, was a one, right, if the, if the slope of this line was one, we'd be a true perfect, right? We want our train loss to be exactly what our test loss is. You can see, however, that our test loss is higher than our train loss. The slope is not exactly one, or I guess the slope has to be one and the intercept has to be zero. Um, but this is sort of a good line, a lot more linear than their line, which was interesting. Um, but that's not the most interesting part. Now what we're gonna do is iterate through various training data sizes. So we wanna see that one over square root of n performance we're looking through here, looking for here. We iterate through, um, and we repeat multiple times and then we iterate through these training data sizes. Once again, it was testing on 200 and then we plot the results. This is not very uh, an interesting graph. It's hard to tell what's going on because there's so much going on. But this is what's interesting. We get our generalization um, errors. Um, we get the absolute value of the difference between these, um, these results and then we take the mean of this uh, so basically the difference between this blue and the blue to orange and orange, et cetera, et cetera, is the generalization error that we're looking at. Um, and then we plot it and you can see it's very rough here. Um, if I plotted more, it would probably, these are probably just outliers, um, but you can see uh, here I didn't fit it. The true bound is something like way up here and you wouldn't see anything because this is an asymptotic upper bound. 
uh, but this is sort of just showing you how it fits this uh, 1 over the square root of n sort of uh, function curve. Um, and so, yeah, you can see the generalization error as number of training samples is you know, approximately 1 over square root of n. It's a lot of fudge going on because it's much lower than the actual bound would dictate. And so it's, you know, even the blips are allowed. It's just trying to sort of convey what this would look like. So, yeah, that's everything. Um, and once again, the paper and the code will be below. I'm just blitzing through this because, you know, it's late, I'm tired. And uh, if any theorists made this long, I'm sorry for uh, disparaging you.